Hey, everybody. Happy Friday to you. I hope everybody's doing well. It's wonderful to see each one of y'all as always. Um, y'all, we got a, another good one today. Uh, Dr. Alex Finkrell is here with us. Um, and I just continue to be amazed by the, the interesting folks that live in our community. Um, and, and if we're looking for silver linings for, from this pandemic, I just can't imagine being able to meet and invite such uh, an array of interesting folks to speak to us. So I just feel lucky. I feel grateful. Um, and, and today we're going to learn a little, little bit about forestry. Um, I didn't even know that one could get a PhD in forestry. Um, you'll see Dr. Finkrell's credentials have places such as Yale on, on there. I think that's a small school in the Northeast. Maybe he'll tell us more about that. Um, but it's bananas. It, here he is doing amazing things uh, as we really have this environmental focus uh, with, with the green team and Alan and Linda and, and, and everything that everyone's doing. I, I just couldn't think of a more appropriate or timely message. Um, we're going to hear a lot today. And so I'll let Dr. Finkrell say more about his interest, his background, and the current work he's doing. But I hope you all uh, join me and giving a warm East Chapel Hill Rotary welcome to Dr. Alex Finkel. Alex? Okay, I'm, un I'm unmuted. <clears throat> uh, thanks, Nick. Yeah, and uh, I I'm not familiar with the Rotary Club, but I'll say in these last 20 minutes, it's like the most sort of upbeat and positive group of people that I've encountered in 12 months or more. It's uh, been kind of strange to sit here and I just don't often I've got three kind of surly children that I spend most of my time with these days so this is kind of a real breath of fresh air already so thank you for having me and I, I'm happy to talk about myself and, and about forestry it's a fairly small fraternity of people globally who um, work in forests and, and know a lot about forests um, but the plan for today was to fill a few minutes in talking about our company, the Forest Land Group, that's based here in Chapel Hill. A little bit about what we do, uh, kind of where things are going, and uh, then end with sort of just a short story about kind of one of our projects that has, has ended really well and was featured in the international news yesterday on, on Earth Day. Uh, but I guess um, we can people can interrupt with questions or we should have a few minutes at the end for a little Q and A. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna just put some slides up here, if that's okay. <clears throat> um, everyone see that? Yes. Uh, thanks to Nick Vaughn too for the the title here of the presentation: Capitalism and Tree Hugging. He came up with that, and it's close enough. It's in the ballpark enough that I decided to go with it. Uh, because that's kind of what we do. It's sort of a private sector for-profit conservation that is uh, managing forest land investments. So <clears throat> a little bit about the company. Um, we're not a huge company, but we control a relatively large amount of forest land in the US and a few other country countries. We just had our 25th anniversary last year. Uh, no kind of big celebrations because of COVID. Uh, we're located right here on East Franklin Street, kind of between Estes and the Whole Foods. Um, right now, we've got a little over $2 billion in assets that we're managing, which is about 2.3 million acres. We always are in flux by a few acres up and down every month every year as we're constantly buying and selling forest land. But currently, and we have been for a bunch of years, we're the third largest forest landowner in the United States. And that's often surprising for people to hear uh, that we're just a small company here in Chapel Hill. We specialize in hardwood forests and natural forests, which are a lot like the forests that are right around here in Chapel Hill. You've got hardwood trees, a lot of pine trees, what we don't do much of is what a lot of other companies like ours do, and that's managing forest plantations, loblolly pine plantations from here down through the coastal plain, North Florida, over into East Texas, in the Pacific Northwest, a lot of Doug fir kinds of plantations. 
we manage forests that regenerate naturally. Acorn hits the ground, a squirrel puts it in the soil, tree grows there, and 80 years later, maybe you're harvesting it for something. So that's our niche, and that's how we've, we've grown large, and we're the largest seller of hardwood logs in the United States. So for those of you who have red oak floors or maple cabinets or cherry dining room furniture, uh, we have a little bit to do with that and uh, sort of production of those products in, the, in this country. We're FSC and SFI certified. Um, not many people know what they are, but they're kind of independent standards that assure the sustainability and quality of what we do. Managing forests is, can be sensitive with some audiences. Uh, and so we try to uh, subscribe to sort of the best practices that we can, the best practices that are available. <clears throat> and then this last point here is probably the biggest one these days. And, and my goodness, if you read any newspapers yesterday on Earth Day, you read a heck of a lot about climate change and the role that forests play in mitigating climate change. Uh, but for the last 10 years, we have been developing forest carbon offset projects and selling offset credits. Uh, and we've now become the largest seller of those credits in the United States. So for about the last 10 years, we've been, um, what we like to say is a pretty big part of the, the climate solution um, in using forests as vehicles for uh, sequestering carbon, atmospheric carbon. Here's a map of where we are as of just a few months ago. The red spots are our current properties. Uh, we go from northern, we go from Canada, kind of on our northern side, all the way down into Panama, really close to Colombia, actually, down here in the corner where we manage teak plantations. Um, very long in the Appalachians and in the deep south in kind of river corridors. I, I frequently tell people that our forests are either where it's really mountainous or really swampy, kind of bottomland hardwoods or mixed hardwood forests in mountains is, is what we do. Uh, and so speaking of what we do, kind of the basic gist is we raise a fund, we acquire properties, we manage those properties for all kinds of different purposes, revenue generation being one of them. Then we sell the properties and we return the capital to the investors. These are safe and relatively sleepy investments, returns in the five to 10% range, um, but uh, uncorrelated with the stock market and you know very low volatility, which is what attracts large institutional investors to this space to be able to place some money into kind of a strange niche investment um, that we usually hold for maybe about 10 years is sort of an average hold time on the kinds of properties that we acquire. So I'm gonna just punch through a few things that we do pretty commonly on our properties and um, end with the carbon uh, offsets, which is really a, a big deal these days. But First thing we do is timber harvesting. Uh, this is what it looks like in West Virginia. A lot of mountain logging. Um, these are all hardwood logs. You can probably tell uh, a lot of poplar and oak and maple and hickory and birch and beech. Uh, different species in different parts of the country, different growth rates in different parts of the country. So we um, try to stay up on things broadly across the United States. This is what Timber harvesting looks like in Costa Rica uh, in one setting where oxen are used, uh, very labor intensive, but results in low soil compaction and uh, low damage to the residual forest stand. Uh, in that previous photo though, really mechanized. I mean, this is modern logging where you spend your day in the cab of a feller buncher or a skidder or a loader or a tractor trailer um, still a very dangerous profession, but getting safer because of technological change. Uh, hunt leases. We lease most of our land for hunting. Uh, those values range from maybe about $2 per acre on the low end in somewhere like upstate New York 
down to $24 an acre in Louisiana, Mississippi. Um, we have moose hunting in Canada, elk hunting in Eastern Kentucky, deer galore, a lot of turkey hunting, squirrels, the, all of the kinds of things that forests are used for. It's a common way for forest landowners to generate revenue. We sell conservation easements. Conservation easements, we call them working forest conservation easements that essentially strip the development potential from a forest. So a forest will always be a forest. It's a fairly strong conservation mechanism that um, allows kind of management practices. So it's not pure preservation, uh, but keeps forests as forests for all kinds of good reasons. And then comes forest carbon. And if I was talking to you 10 years ago, this was all still sort of a futuristic thing. And that's no longer the case, that, that there are pretty well-developed markets now for forest carbon offsets. offsets. In this diagram, the take-home message is that you know, we all emit carbon through heating our homes and driving our cars and charging our iPhones. That goes into the atmosphere. Forests are constantly drinking in CO2 from the atmosphere. Pollution that is emitted in China, the same carbon dioxide is sequestered in forests right here in Chapel Hill. That's basically what wood is. Wood is about half carbon as it grows on a tree. So forests have been identified as a pretty effective way and a very cost effective way of taking some emissions out of the atmosphere to slow or stop changing climate. What are environmental offsets? In this case, forest carbon offsets. You pollute over here and we balance the equation over here through forest land ownership and management. And the polluters pay uh, approximately $10 a ton, would just be a, a round number that I'll use right now. Uh, and they pay to continue emitting and have kind of a neutral balance. So just as so, in so, some maybe kind of useful numbers, the average American emits about 20 metric tons of carbon dioxide in a given year. And the average acre of Eastern hardwood forests, like around Chapel Hill, absorbs about two to three tons of carbon dioxide per year. So for the average American, you know, maybe 10 acres or a little less would offset your emissions in just letting a forest be a forest and continue to grow. Uh, we've grown pretty large doing this. And in fact, in the last couple of years, uh, we've generated more revenue from carbon sales than we have from log sales, which is a big deal if you think that, if you consider that we're the largest seller of hardwood logs in the United States. So. Uh, it's real money now. We've, we've sold over $160 million in carbon offsets, uh, primarily through California's regulatory market, where large power utilities need to offset their emissions to continue operating refineries. So Shell and BP and all of the large petroleum companies are buying offsets of this kind to continue operating in California. These, uh, this map over here on the right, I'm sorry, are where our projects are. So um, some that we've already sold to other owners, some that are in development, some that are still existing. <clears throat> well, I'm gonna shift gears now and just talk a little bit about a kind of case study of a, a fairly typical example of something that we've done over the last 12 years that has ended well. But I wanted to put this slide up to point out that things don't go well too all the time. Uh, and there are all kinds of different disturbance regimes around the country that can really damage forests. And sometimes when people think of forests as investments, they think of wildfire in the West, hurricane damage in the Gulf Coast. I always like to put the Carolina hurricane kind of conundrum over there too. And I keep counting the years since they've, uh, you know, tiptoed toward the Stanley Cup. Uh, insect pests, emerald ash borer here. If you have an ash tree in Chapel Hill in your yard, 
and it's died in the last year or two, probably because of this insect here that uh, is an invasive insect that's now in this area. Uh, ice storms and the mountains, tornadoes down through the tornado belt in Oklahoma and the deep south. Um, these are all things that we account for. And when we're buying forest properties in a fund, we have a geographic distribution that tries to mitigate that risk. So it's one of the greater sources of risk. And Hurricane Michael, for example, two years ago that came up across the Florida panhandle, uh, it did a great amount of damage to one of our forests. And that's the kind of story that I talk about uh, and how we've kind of handled that issue and how we sort of clean up the pieces in the wake of a storm like that. But we're limited on time and I'm gonna talk about sort of a feel good story that is in Belize, the little country of Belize. When most people from this area go to Belize on vacation, they kind of stick around the coast. There is a terrific reef a lot of great diving and fishing in this part of the Yucatan Peninsula. But for the last 12 years, we've owned about 240,000 acres in one piece right here on the Guatemalan border. There's another little map over here. The orange piece in the map is, uh, was our, our property. And it's part of this greater forest area that you can see in the dark green on the map. It's the largest intact forest in Central America. In 2008, we bought a controlling interest from a family in Texas that owned about 130,000 acres. In 2012, we added an adjacent 110,000 acres. And um, it's one of the prettiest places ever. You know, it's it's a uh, classic intact tropical forest with a, a, an amazing diversity of species. You know, whereas in Chapel Hill, an average acre of forest, and these are fairly diverse forests, would have 15 to 25 different tree species. Uh, here you have about 200 different woody species per acre, uh, just as, a, as an example wildlife, including five different big cat species, including jaguars. Um, so this is really extraordinary forest with both flora and fauna species. We spent our time selectively harvesting it, sustainably managing timber and exporting mahogany. It was kind of the bread and butter species here. Um, and our harvest operations pretty much allowed us to break even as an investment covered a lot of the bills. Some years we made a little money, some years we didn't. Um, export markets all over the world, including to the US, we have sold our mahogany to almost all of the major guitar makers in the United States. It's a tone wood used in instruments like violins and guitars. And <clears throat> throughout our ownership, there was a real uh, encroachment from farmers, corn and bean farmers serving the glo global market, which again is the classic tale of deforestation uh, right immediately adjacent to this forest that we own. So to kind of make a long story short, we worked for years and years cultivating relationships with conservation organizations. And just at the very end of last year, in December of 2020, we sold these pieces to the Nature Conservancy and a consortium of global conservation organizations. Uh, so from an investment standpoint, we're able to return the capital to our investors. Uh, we've, throughout our ownership, managed to kind of take this fee simple land base and permanently protect it through a sale to a conservation organization. And the Nature Conservancy just announced this yesterday in the Guardian and a whole bunch of other places. So. This was um, a big story yesterday among the many other big stories. So that was a, I'm not saying all of our work is like that, but uh, it was just a very recent example of a fairly large scale forest investment that ended up in a significant conservation outcome. So with that, I'll end with this, uh, this very accurate artistic depiction of what goes on in our forest. This is uh, really how it looks. Um, 
And if there are <clears throat> questions, be happy to uh, talk through it in the few minutes that we have left. Alex, that was great. Thank you so much. We um, we frequently have some great questions. I've got one that I'll I'll start with if you don't mind. Um, two observations. Number, number one, I, maybe I just missed it, but it seemed that your holdings in the United States seemed to be pretty much east Mississippi or east. Was I correct in that, or, or is there just a void? Can you speak to why there's not presence so much in the Pacific Northwest or other places where I might, I might think of big forests? Is it, is it the hardwood component? or okay. is it Yeah, you've better? answered your question. Exactly, yeah. That broadleaf forest, hardwood okay. forest, deciduous forest is all pretty much east of the Mississippi, a little yeah. bit to the west, but uh, eastern North America for sure. And as you go farther west, for those of you who go to Colorado and, and beyond, mm -hmm. it's uh, conifer dominated and public lands dominated. The vast majority of forest owned in the western half of the United States are owned by the Bureau of Land Management, the U.S. Forest Service, the Park Service. Uh, with a concentration of conifer plantation ownership in Washington and Oregon that uh, is just not what we do. Someday maybe we'll get into that more, but um, we're, we, we've specialized in the sort of wetter, greener, eastern North American forest. Makes sense. One other, the, my second question was different part of the, of the planet here, but when you just ended with, with Belize, um, 230,000 acres is a significant size tract of, of, of land. My question is in Belize or in any other places that would be, I would imagine more difficult to have oversight. What is your, what is the, what is the, what does your team look like or what does the oversight look like? I mean, I can imagine in the second world or, or, or anywhere else that you may have places where there's not when you have remote areas and large, large tracts of land, what is your oversight just to just to keep folks from rolling up and and timbering a section of? I mean, is, is there do you have a, a group that is, is that monitors that patrols that, that oversees these properties? How does that work? Yeah, that's a, that's another great question, Kevin. Thank you. Uh, and as in any business, it all comes down to sort of people and relationships and and trust and. Um, you know, it's funny because a lot of people get into forestry because they want to be left alone and they want to be in the woods. But I always say that, that forest management is about 95% about managing people. And if you know how a tree grows, that comes in handy for the other 5% of what you need to do. Uh, and yes, when you acquire lands in Costa Rica or Belize, or uh, you know, we've been looking lately in Brazil and Suriname, uh, it makes it all the, all the more difficult. So, um, the, the company here in Chapel Hill is split about half and half with uh, people with financial expertise and the, the end that deals with the accounting and the quarterly reporting and the, the management of the investments and about half forestry expertise. The forestry team uh, oversees a lot of consultants and out, outsourced uh, forest management that's on the ground and in more far flung places we just really work hard to develop good relationships with people that we trust. And uh, some of us go back and forth quite a bit uh, to, to places, you know, uh, in the last 10 years, I've spent uh, probably uh, about six to 10 times a year. I've, I've gone to Belize, for example, uh, for a few days here and there, here and there, here and there. Um, and this last year has been very different. None of us have been traveling much. Uh, so it's been more important than ever that we're able to talk and trust and understand what's going on. There are examples, though, of where that still isn't enough and where there is theft and timber trespass and you know, money stolen and managers who are corrupt. And so it, I would never say it couldn't happen to us, but it's um, definitely a, a critically important part of the job. Excellent. Alex, you've got a lot of hands up here. That's great. That's a, a nice compliment to what an interesting uh, presentation you've given. Pat Phelan has a question. Yeah, Alex, thanks for uh, talking to our group. Um, I just had a question about the carbon offsets. So how much pollution would ExxonMobil be purchasing to offset? Well, how many offsets would they be purchasing from you to offset their pollution they put in the air? Uh, yeah, good question. Um, you know, tens of millions of tons. Uh, 
So on, on that scale, and with a lot of the big announcements in the last few weeks about big companies, Apple and Amazon and Google beginning to address the issue, you're looking at numbers like, uh, you know, 100 million tons are their sort of objectives. And there are not a lot of, right now there are, there's, the demand is outstripping the supply. And so there are not many companies that can really run transactions on a scale with a BP and a shell other than ours. Like we're, we're that's why we've gotten large fast because we were, uh, we're able to sort to, to manage trans transactions on a scale of tens of millions of tons. Okay. And, and you're allowed to do that based on how many acres you, you all own? That's right. That's okay. exactly. So, uh, <clears throat> The way these projects work is you take 100 acres, you go out and measure the trees, and then the growth of those trees every year uh, is, is remeasured every six years. And that incremental growth is translated to carbon sequestered from the, from the atmosphere based on a handful of equations. And so that's the proof that you have not harvested the timber, it is not burned down, but in fact, it's still there on site continuing to uh, photosynthesize and convert atmospheric carbon to wood. Oh, great. Thank you. Liz Hinkey has a question. Liz, are you on the call still? Yeah, I think she's muted. Right, my fault. You're muted, you Liz. Yeah. Okay, can you hear me now? Sorry. Yes. Um, sorry, part of my question uh, you answered. Pat, thank you very much. A great, great talk. Um, <clears throat> so, um, what's the um, your ratio of logging to um, planting? That's a good question. Thank you. Uh, we so okay, um, and that's this is really our niche is what's called natural regeneration, and. You know, I could go on and on about the 150 years of science uh, that we understand about natural regeneration, but the alternative version of this is if you were to stop mowing your lawn, within a few years, it would become a young forest. And so this has been going on for millions of years, and it's basically trees seeding and competing where they want to. We plant on less than 1% of our land base, and that is probably the inverse of what different timberland investment managers do where they're clear cutting a loblolly plantation, 20 acres, 80 acres at a time, replanting the next year, growing, cutting fiber production. Uh, loblolly pine you would manage on a 20 to 25 year rotation from planting to final harvest. Hardwood forests are more like 80 year rotations where uh, an oak tree begins to grow and you let it grow for 80 years until you're harvesting it. So way less intensive of an operation for different species and different products. And in the meantime, creating significant habitat and other ecosystem benefits. Thank you very much. So we don't plant a lot, but a lot of managers do plant a lot. Tom Shea has a question. Thanks. Um Thanks, Alan. That was great. Um, so again, on the carbon offset, I think most of us don't, or many of us don't really understand how that process works, but um, effectively, are they renting property on an annual basis from you? Um, or do they say, okay, you know, we're in it for 20 years, we're in it for 10 years, we're in it for 100 years. How do they, how do, they do that? Because obviously they continue to generate more carbon every year and the forests themselves don't expand. Um, so kind of how do they, how, how does it work, I guess, yeah. from that end? And of course they don't buy it, but you know. And, and I think what you're getting at is what is called permanence, you know, that you can't sell carbon offsets and then the next year cut your forest down or uh, have it burned down in a fire. Uh, and so, there are different structures for these forest carbon projects that are emerging and evolving at this time. And new ones are figuring out ways to have a very short-term encumbrance on your land. But the 
current structures that are used most often are 40 to 100 year encumbrances on your property. So we will develop a forest carbon project that requires us to not harvest any more timber than what exists there today. And anything above and beyond what is there today can either be harvested or sold as carbon offsets for the next hundred years. We then generate those annual offset credits from that growth and we can sell those to anyone that we want or we can not sell them, bank them for five years, wait for carbon prices to go to $30 a ton from $10 a ton. And therein lies a whole bunch of different sort of market gains. Uh, but the way, let's that go most, a Come on, let's go. the way let's that go most here. of these deals are now is it's kind of like a, a long-term easement of up to a hundred years uh, where you've given away some of the timber rights. Gotcha. Thanks very much. Good. Dave, Dave Moreau has a question. I've got a couple of questions, Alex. Thanks. First of all, I noticed that much of your properties are in uh, southeastern uh, West Virginia. And uh, that's also prime coal country. Are you uh, buying lands from coal companies or uh, what, what locates you in Southeast West Virginia? West Virginia in general is one of the most fascinating places I've ever worked. Uh, and Southern West Virginia in particular, for those of you who know it, is uh, among the most biodiverse and prettiest places in the country. It's also kind of one of the roughest and most economically depressed places where we work. So just want to make mention of that because uh, for a handful of you, you may know West Virginia come from there and understand that. And it's, uh, it's really a, a, an interesting place. Uh, to answer your question, Dave, Almost all the time we coexist with coal companies because they own the mineral rights, the, the sort of subsurface rights, and we own the surface rights, including the timber. But sometimes that's even split further. And on a few hundred thousand of our acres in West Virginia, we own just the timber rights, not the surface rights or the mineral rights. So we can sell timber and sell carbon offsets, but we can't prevent ATV recreation or trespass or access across the surface because we don't own those surface rights. So uh, <clears throat> that's one part of the answer. The other part of the answer that's interesting is that when a coal mine, a surface mine is being established, uh, we are able to go in and clear cut all of the timber off of that 150 acres before the mine establishment, which we do often, but honestly, not much at all in the last three, four years. So um, I don't know that coal is sort of dead and gone forever, but boy, it's suffered a very steep decline for what I, what I understand are mostly economic reasons. My other question was, uh, you mentioned these large investors uh, and the, clearly the large companies that are buying the offsets. Uh, it's, is that almost exclusively who you deal with or are there smaller investors? We have a real mixed bunch of investors, some high net worth uh, invest individuals, uh, endowments, university endowments, some of the blue schools that were mentioned earlier in the call. Um, in fact, I mean, just a, a lot of university endowments uh, and, and foundations. Um, pension funds, but um, there are you know, quite a few individuals too who are investors, but that's different than who we sell the carbon offsets to, which by and large have been major uh, pollution refinery kinds of organizations. Thanks, great presentation. Thanks, yeah. Brian Keeliff has a question. <laughs> Alex, absolutely fascinating talk. Uh, so many things to ask you, but let me ask you this one quick, uh, and that is, what is what hope are you with in this very environmentally sensitive time? We have these uh, environmental talks going on right now. What contribution worldwide is forestry going to be able to do towards mitigating climate change 
compared to say solar and uh, wind and so forth? Are you optimistic? How big does it have to be? Are we gaining? Are we losing? Tell us where we are. Well, that's yeah, great. And um, I mean, personally, uh, you know, uh, depending on the year or the federal administration, I'm optimistic or not. And I'm sure I'm no different than the rest of you in reading those tea leaves. Uh, from a scientific standpoint, I can say that we need all of the answers put into a pile to even come close to addressing the scale of problems. So alternative energy sources like solar or riding your bike more than driving a car, forests at best will probably solve about 20% of the global problem. And that would be, um, yeah, I mean, that's probably a good way to think about it. 15 to 20% is the part of the answer that forests can contribute which is significant, you know, that's, um, uh, I mean, U.S. forests might come close to offsetting the U.S. vehicle emissions in a given year, um, as, as one example. But we've got to think globally in terms of um, development of forest conservation to address, address the issue along with everything else. Alex, we're going to be counting on you. We need your help in this one. Well, I'm counting on you and everyone else to, you know, maybe walk to the market instead of uh, driving your Humvee. All right. <laughs> I think I think we've got time for one last question. I see Bill's iPad. I'm not sure who, which Bill that is, but Bill's iPad has a question. That's me. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Alex. Yeah, Bill Boland here. Um, Alex, the, very interesting. Uh, some of us are wood turners. Uh, we are woodworkers that dislike all different types of wood. You mentioned, particularly from Belize, you mentioned the mahogany. Do you also sell like purple heart, cocobolo, different types of rosewood? There's a company we deal with called World Timber down in Hubert, North Carolina. You, you, you may well deal with that. Uh, where does that wood come from and where does it go? Wow, okay, I'll keep it short because I know we're out of time. A lot of neighbors ask me about tropical woods uh, when they're doing something neat or building a dock or, uh, you know, and, and not at a small scale, like wood turning and, and sort of furniture making, but, you know, as far as flooring and decking and things. And, and I always say this, that if you're buying tropical woods, you really don't know much at all about where it's coming from and how it's produced. And probably the answer is probably not very well, right? That it's, it's a murky, murky business. Uh, you know, I happen to be involved firsthand in some operations such that I'm confident I know what's going on. But yeah. beyond that, um, tread lightly with, uh, with tropical woods, which I love, incidentally. But I always tell neighbors, think about U.S. woods. And we're growing them here. You're buying them locally. Uh, some terrific species and terrific options. They then abruptly ignore my advice and buy, uh, you know, a Brazilian cherry sort of flooring of some kind, uh, which is which is fine. But uh, I do try to tell them that don't don't think because of green labeling you can kind of be assured that you really know anything about it. Thanks, Alex. Thank you so much for joining us today. This is it was a fantastic presentation, super interesting, um, really great stuff, and we're grateful for you sharing your afternoon with us. Well, thank all of you again. Uh, the first 20 minutes were the happiest part of my day. <laughs>